Hello, today I will tell you about a new universal framework for functional encryption that we call multi-party functional encryption. The goal of multi-party functional encryption is to encapsulate all existing functional encryption schemes under a single umbrella, even in the multi-user setting. The starting point of this talk is the notion of function encryption itself, whose roots can be traced as uh, can, can be traced back as early as 2005. FA is a powerful notion of encryption with the goal of enabling fine-grained decryption access over encrypted data. Pictorially, the intuition behind function encryption can be understood using the following example. Suppose we have three parties, Alice, Bob, and Charlie. Alice has insensitive data M, Bob has the secret key, and Charlie wants to learn the evaluation of a function F on the secret data. In order to compute this, what Bob can do is that Bob can simply give the secret key to Charlie, Charlie can decrypt it, compute F, and learn F of M. But what if we want Charlie to only learn F of M and nothing else about the underlying message? And what if Charlie does not want to outsource this computation to Bob, or it does not want Bob to be online for this computation? To capture all such interesting scenarios that go beyond the traditional definition of encryption, the notion of functional encryption was devised. In functional encryption, Bob can actually decrypt or can create some partial decryption keys for a function f, such that given this partial decryption keys, these function keys, Charlie can perform this computation on its own and learn only f of m, nothing else about the message m. Abstractly, a functional encryption scheme is parameterized by two classes, a function class and an input class. Here we are viewing fe as a scheme in which messages in the input class can be encrypted, and partial decryption keys or functional keys for functions in the function class can be computed such that combining a single ceftext secret key pair, we get the desired function evaluation, that is f of m. And the intuition behind security for functional encryption is that given an encryption of an input x and polynomially many secret keys, say for functions f1 up to fq, the adversary only learns the evaluations of all those functions that it has a key for, for the underlying message x and nothing else. And as I was alluding to earlier, FE has been a grand unifier, wherein it enabled placing all previously known encryption systems at that time under a single umbrella. For illustrative purposes, let us consider the simple example of identity-based encryption, which was introduced in uh, 1984 by Hadi Shamir. The goal of identity-based encryption is to let the encryptor only be aware of the recipient's identity instead of their exact public key. Now, IBE can also be captured by function encryption by this simple equality check class. Similarly, we can also capture attribute-based encryption, which is much more fine-grained access uh, control system by function encryption by using appropriate function classes as well. And there's so many more encryption concepts that are special case of, cases of function encryption. Now, since its formalization over a decade ago, FE has turned out to be a very meaningful and powerful cryptographic concept as it unified not only at all at that time, all existing encryption functionalities, but it helped in predicting new concepts. And it also served as the right abstraction to study relationships between numerous cryptographic objects, including program obfuscation. It has been a radical concept such that it has been further generalized to many more general multi-user models. Now, some of you might be wondering, what do I mean by a multi-user model? Wasn't FE already defined for multiple users? And even in my simple example, I had already three parties, Alice, Bob, and Charlie. Well, that is true. The point is that despite the incredible expressiveness of FE, the decryption still takes as input, the single ceftex and secret key pair as input. Thus the question becomes, what happens if there are multiple different data sources? Or what if there are multiple independent key holders? Or maybe there's a mixture of both. There are multiple keys, multiple suffix, and we want to learn computation about all of them at the same time. It turns out that this goes beyond the abstraction of regular single party functional encryption. And to that end, numerous generalizations have been proposed. Let me elaborate on them. The earliest work was by Goldwasser et al, where they proposed something called uh, multi-input function encryption, which was in the domain of multiple data sources, where the ceftex can be computed for different independently uh, chosen message values, x1 up to xn, 
and the decryption can combine multiple different ceftext given a single secret key and learn the corresponding value f of x1 up to xn. Recently, the notion of uh, MIFE was further generalized to the notion of multi-client function encryption, where the point is that instead of having just uh, basically in, uh, in multi-client function encryption, the inputs x1 also contain some public labels and the computation only succeeds if the public labels for all the input suffix they match. Similarly, there has been much progress in the domain of distributing secret keys as well. But it's been mostly from the perspective of either key escrow or adding extra functionality. The earliest works were referred to as multi-authority encryption, where there are multiple sources and suffix contain a secret function instead. So here you can see the ciphertex contains a function g and secret keys contain some attributes or some input values y1 up to yn. And the evaluation of this decryption functionality is going to give me the eval output of the secret function g on these particular input values. Recently, more such notions such as decentralized function encryption has also been started. And lastly, as I was alluding to earlier, there has been a lot of recent progress on distributing both ciphertex and secret keys. The first work in this line was by Chodal and all, who defined what they described as decentralized version of multi-client functional encryption, combining these two previously defined multi-user systems. Briefly, in such systems, we have suppose an n uh, a polynomial number of ciphertext and a polynomial number of secret keys. And these ciphertext and secret keys can be combined to learn the evaluation of a function f on inputs x1 up till xn, where x1 up till xn are encoded in the ciphertext and function f are encoded inside the secret keys, all these independent secret keys, as long as the labels of the ciphertext they match. Very recently, there have been further extended, these, these notion of this decentralized multi-client function encryption has been further extended and generalized to give concepts of ad hoc multi uh, input function encryption, as well as dynamic decentralized function encryption where ad hoc multi-input function encryption, it generalized the concept of decentralized MCFE to remove labels and add unbounded additive. And very recently, dynamic decentralized function encryption, it generalized ad hoc MIFE even further to have the concept of totally dynamic and local setup and allowed key combination across different inputs and the secret keys do not have the same function encoded inside of them. Overall, this shows that there is a vast unexplored universe of encryption functionality that has yet to be studied. Additionally, the study of functional encryption in the multi-user setting has been similar to the pre-single user, these pre-single user uh, functional encryption days, where many new models were proposed and studied. And it seemed that they were quite related, and but it was often difficult to understand how they compare to each other and whether they use related techniques. And even what is known in terms of feasibility for different encryption functionalities. And this has been going on as well in the multi-user setting today, because we have these amazing different models of uh, multi-user encryption systems for function encryption systems like distributed ciphertext, distributed keys, and both of them. And they have different applications. And it's, it's a bit inconvenient that how can we try to compare them? While they all were designed for different applications, different user models, the process of studying new notions and comparing the techniques that we already have has become very infeasible. To that end, in this work, we study the notion of, or the question of encapsulating multi-user function encryption, function encryption multi-user models in a more systematic framework, similar to what was done by Bonnet Sahin models over a decade ago for single user model. Now, in the, the main contributions of our work is that uh, we introduce this notion of multi-party functional encryption that is meant to capture and unify all notion of functional encryption in these multi-user models. We also propose a new, um, we also propose new multi-user encryption functionalities that go beyond what has been previously studied. And we also give some interesting new uh, instantiations for these functionalities from standard assumptions. Now, moving on, I will define the notion of, uh, define the framework of multi-party functional encryption. Now, in order to jointly capture uh, the notion of ciphertext policy and key policy uh, uh, systems, 
in functional encryption is more holistically. We define the input spaces for both ciphertext and secret keys instead of defining them a function space for each of them individually. Now, jumping a little bit ahead, the main point in multi-party functional encryption is the possibility of combining multiple ciphertext and secret keys at the same time during decryption in order to learn interesting functional uh, values. A natural question would be, how would this or what would this combination look like? I mean, how can we combine these things? Now, our suggestion is to define two aggregation functions, each for the ciphertext and secret key input spaces separately. And these aggregation functions are going to be tied to the underlying encryption system. And now the decryption algorithm is going to compute the universal circuit on the individually aggregated input and uh, function values, or it's like the key values as well as the ciphertext values. Now, pictorially, this could be visualized as follows. You have these uh, input values stored inside the ciphertext, and you have, you have these Y values, these input values inside the secret keys. Now, multi-party function encryption says that these input values can be aggregated first using the corresponding aggregation functions. And then after applying the universal circuit, we learn the corresponding value of the underlying function that we want to learn using the multi-party function encryption system. Now, a little more syntactically, in functional encryption systems, we would have a setup algorithm in which the setup algorithm would take as input the aggregation functions association, associated with the functional encryption, uh, functional encryption system. It also takes as input the arity of the ciphertext and the secret keys that we want to consider in this, uh, consider in this model. Now, the arity of the secret key and the ciphertext could be optional. Suppose in the case we want to have totally dynamic uh, functional computing systems. In that case, these will not be given as input to the setup algorithm. Now, in addition to these inputs, the setup algorithm also takes as input the mode of the computation, whether it's performed in the central mode or a local mode or an interactive mode. And what do I mean by that? So first, let us imagine that the setup algorithm generates a sequence of public parameters, encryption keys, and master secret keys. Now, if I, if I input the central mode to the setup algorithm, then this setup algorithm is being performed by a trusted party which generates all these parameters in a trusted manner, and then it distributes to the all corresponding users in the system. In the local mode, this setup algorithm is performed in a non-interactive and totally independent way by all users independently. And lastly, in the interactive mode, it is a protocol between all the users at the input time and during that mode, interaction can happen, but after that, there is no interaction going on further during the encryption system. So in summary, in multi-party function encryption, just like function encryption, we have a setup mode, but setup mode can be run in now one of three modes, local, interactive, or trusted. And it samples all the public keys, the encryption keys and the master keys for the corresponding function encryption system. And given the encryption keys, one can encrypt, encode the input, the message inputs or the ciphertext inputs into a ciphertext. And using the master secret keys, one can create some partial decryption keys for these function inputs or these ciphertext secret key inputs. And the decryption algorithm can take as input arbitrary number of these or just a predefined number of ciphertext and secret keys and combine them to learn appropriate function values allowed by the underlying multi-party function encryption system. Now, the security, since these functional encryption systems are very powerful, the security for these systems can also be very complicated to state. Now, here I'm going to give you a very high level brief intuition of what's the intuition behind uh, security for multi-party functional encryption. So suppose an adversary is given a polynomial number of ciphertext, which contain encryptions of different inputs for different, under different encryption, under different uh, encryption keys for different uh, inputs. And we also given, uh, encoding of different inputs, the secret keys for these inputs under the corresponding master secret keys. Now we say the scheme is secure as long as the adversary only learns the evaluation values that it can learn by performing the decryption algorithm by running the decryption algorithm honestly. So it can take any combination of the ciphertext and secret keys, run the decryption algorithm, and whatever the output of the decryption algorithm is, that's all the adversary can learn and nothing else. Now, this can be formalized by an indistinguishability key, and this is what we formally do in our paper. And we also allow corrupting master keys or encryption keys, and we have to define the leakage corresponding that uh, allowed leakage to the adversary in that case. And for more details, I refer you to the paper. And
and just uh, to give a little bit of uh, more uh, uh, input in how we actually do it in the paper, we actually also break uh, the inputs in the ciphertext and the secret keys into two domains where we have like a public part and a private part, which basically makes a cleaner, app, uh, which makes a cleaner framework for eventual applications. Suppose you want to define the notion of partially hiding functional encryption. It becomes easier when we sort of define, we split our inputs into two domains, into two components, a public and a private component. Now, before proceeding further, let me actually show you the expressiveness of multi-party functional encryption. And let me tell you why MPFE actually unifies all existing notions of functional encryption that we have studied so far. For starters, let us consider the simple example of multi-input functional encryption. Now recall that in multi-input uh, functional encryption, we have say a polynomial number of ciphertexts that can be jointly decrypted using a single function uh, uh, decryption key to learn f of uh, the value from the function f on the all the inputs at the same time. Now, in order to instantiate this using multi-party function encryption, the idea is that we will run the setup in the central trusted mode. We will substitute the number of uh, arity of the secret key to be one, the aggregation function to be one, the arity of the uh, of the ciphertext to be m, the number of messages that we want to, or the number of slots, encryption slots that we want, and the aggregation function to be the identity function again. This is going to generate the key material. And using this key material, we can encrypt all these inputs x1 up to xm. Using the corresponding encryption values, we can, we can uh, encode the function using the master secret key. And finally, trying to decrypt this using the multi-party function encryption decryption algorithm, we're going to learn the universal circuit on the aggregated values since the aggregation is just the identity function and we apply the universal circuit on top of it, that's why we will learn the evaluation of the function f on the underlying message values. So this basically matches what multi-input function encryption is trying to do in a more general manner. Now let us also look at the distributed secret key setting. This was the distributed ciphertext setting. Now in the distributed secret key setting, let us look at the multi-authority function encryption systems. Now, in multi-authority function encryption systems, as I referred to previously, the functions are encoded in the ciphertext and secret keys have these partial inputs that we want to encode in the secret keys, such that decryption is going to learn the evaluation of the secret G on these values y1 up to yn. Now, as you probably would have guessed, in order to instantiate this using our uh, multi-party function encryption system, now we substitute n to be the arity of the secret keys, m to be the m is equal to be the one to be the arity of the ciphertext and identity be the aggregate functions in both cases. And now we're going to select the local mode because it's a multi-authority mode. The setup is going to be performed in local mode. And this is going to generate the public keys and the master secret keys for all of these authorities individually. And the idea is that choosing all the master public keys together, uh, user can encrypt uh, the uh, policy G on its own. And using all these master secret keys individually, the authority can generate these partial decryption keys for inputs Y1 up to YN. And the idea is that the decryption algorithm combine all these elements and that will sort of give us the universal function again on this identity aggregated function of G and Y1 up to YN, which can be simplified to be the evaluation of the function G secret function G on the inputs Y1 up to YN, thereby again matching the syntax of multi-authority functional encryption. Now, this basically shows that multi-party functional encryption can actually be uh, used to unify all these existing encryption systems. And looking ahead, can we use multi-party functional encryption to even forecast something, predict new inter interesting functionalities? Now, in this work, we actually show that we can compose functional encryption for different functionalities and user models to come up with some very interesting function, functionalities. For example, previously, we have only studied multi-authority attribute-based encryption systems or attribute-based encryption systems in which the function spaces were inner product functionalities. Now, in this work, we say we can actually combine all of these together to define something called multi-authority attribute-based inner product functional encryption systems. We can also define decentralized notions of predicate encryption, where the message uh, functionality is the inner product functional encryption uh, functionality. Additionally, 
as I was referring to previously, the notion of dynamic de decentralized function encryption has been defined as very powerful, but unfortunately that notion does not provide function hiding. So we say that multi-party function encryption says that DDFE can be extended to define the function hiding uh, uh, counterparts for that. Lastly, we can also sort of ask that typically when we look at into distributed secret key setting for multi uh, for uh, for function encryption, then in that case, all these different key materials are typically intended for a single user. It's a single user secret key that is spread, that is generated by multiple authorities. But what if we want to combine key materials for different users, for totally different independent users? This is totally unlike multi-authority or decentralized encryption. And this is something that we sort of formalize using reputation-based encryption. And we show that these are interesting models that has not been previously studied, but they make sense just because we are visualizing functional encryption in a totally multi-party setting. Now, in this work, we also give many new interesting positive results by giving new uh, functional encryption systems for in the, in the multi-user setting for interesting functionalities from standard assumptions. Just as a quick summary, we built multi-authority attribute-based inner product function encryption systems where the predicate class is monotone span programs and we just rely on bilinear groups for uh, building such function classes. We also showed that we can build decentralized attribute-based inner product function encryption systems, but now we are also gonna hide the policy in one side, but then we can only guarantee it for inner product functionalities in terms of predicates. But again, we only sh uh, show this by relying on bilinear groups. And you also show that we can lift the, uh, the, the DDFT construction for inner products and make it function hiding by just relying on bilinear groups in the random oracle model. And lastly, we also give how to distribute SAFTEX policy attribute-based encryption systems that have been recently studied by relying on assumptions such as learning with errors and the bilinear the generic group model. And we additionally also show that we give uh, interesting feasible results for uh, multi-party function encryptions by relying on the minimal assumption of multi-input function encryptions. And I would just advise you to look at the paper for all these details, because I'm going to only summarize what we sort of show in this work, but uh, there are so many interesting results in our paper. So moving on, I'm only going to focus in on the first part of the result and where I will tell you how to design this multi-authority attribute-based inner product function encryption system for monotone span programs. Now, moving ahead, in order to actually construct it, I have to first define what multi-authority attribute-based IPFE is, because this has not been defined previously. So first, let us recall SAFTEX policy attribute-based encryption and inner product function encryption. Now, in a SAFTEX uh, uh, policy attribute-based function encryption system, we have input spaces in which input spaces encode a policy circuit phi, a predicate of a policy circuit phi, and some payload messages M. And we also have these function spaces, this, uh, these key spaces, which are going to encode some strings Y, some input strings Y. And the idea is that the functionality that attribute-based encryption systems they compute, it is the evaluating the function F on uh, the function F corresponding to the input Y on the input X, which encodes this predicate phi and the payload M. Then it's going to give us the message M, the corresponding payload, and the predicate fee, as long as the predicate fee is satisfied on the key input, key attribute Y. So the key contains some inputs and the key input is satisfied on the, on the SAF text uh, predicate. Then we basically learn the message M, otherwise we do not. Now, IPFE simply says that you always learn something. Suppose I give you an encryption of uh, a vector X and a an key for a vector Y then IPFE allows computing in a drug of X and Y, but nothing else about the, the vector X. And that's the notion of identity-based function encryption. In ABE, there is a notion of fine-grained access. If you satisfy a predicate, then only you learn some information. In IPFE, you always learn some information, but some partial functional information about the underlying message space, which is, uh, or the input space, which is X in this case. Now, a natural question is that, okay, what happens if we combine ABE and IPFE? Now combining ABE and IPFE, we get attribute-based IPFE. In attribute-based IPFE, now instead of having a message M as part of the input space, as part of the inputs, the SAFTEX input space, we have a vector Y and 
as part of the uh, SAFT, as part of the key inputs, they're going to have this input W again, this input attribute W, and also a key vector V. And the idea is that evaluating this function F uh, uh, W and comma V on the input phi comma uh, U is going to give us the inner product between U and vector V. So the vector V in the key, the message U, the message vector in the, in, in the cipher text, as long as the predicate is satisfied on the input attribute, on the key attribute W. Otherwise we do not learn anything. So if the attribute is satisfied, then you learn some partial evaluation of the function of the message vector. Otherwise you don't learn anything. So this is more powerful than attribute-based encryption systems because an attribute-based encryption system, it is an all or nothing encryption primitive. You either learn everything or you learn nothing. In IPFE, you always learn something. Combining both of these things, you have a more fine-grained access structure. You, you, will all, you might not learn anything, but even if you might learn something, you might learn just some partial information. So you can equivalently say that the function that is being computed here is the evaluate is the inner product between the message vector and the key vector multiplied by the predicate value, whether the predicate is satisfied or not. And this notion was very recently studied by Abdallah et al, where they proposed AB IPFE for monotone span programs just from bilinear maps. And this was a very interesting result. Now in this work, we say, that's great, but attribute-based encryption systems are very meaningful in the multi-authority setting. Then can we try to decentralize AB IPFE this notion of fine-grained access structure of attribute-based structure to, decent, to the multi-authority setting. And our idea is that we will take this input, this key space, this key inputs, and try to distribute the, them into multiple keys. Now, each key vector is going to consist of a portion of the key, uh, of the, of the key vector, uh, a portion of the, of the uh, attribute that we want to satisfy and the input key vector. And the idea is that combining and the aggregation function will combine all of these different key inputs such that it will append simply all the inputs w1 up to wn into a single input string into a single attribute space uh, attribute string and it basically checks whether the the key vector that is associated with the function class that is actually the same it basically copies the same vector the key vector and it at it appends all the all the input attributes as which are part of the different uh, different key inputs. And once you aggregate them, then this basically is just the aggregated function. And since there's only a single SAF text, you evaluate this single SAF text on this particular aggregated function. Now, how to actually construct, go about constructing such multi-authority attribute-based uh, IPFE schemes? Now, one could actually start with the uh, Abdullah et al. construction. But due to some technical reasons, we were not able to make it multi-authority scheme directly. But instead, we looked back at a much older scheme of Luco and Waters, which built multi-authority attribute-based encryption schemes, which don't have any functional encryption property, but it, they do have multi-authority property from bilinear maps for monotone span programs. And we tried to sort of just move around this uh, construction, just to work with it and modify it such that we can add this IPFE capability to it. So in order to explain our construction, let me just give you a much simplified overview of local waters construction. So in the local waters construction, each authority, it samples a random, uh, a random exponent, alpha i, and it sets the encoding of alpha i, this bracket means the encoding of alpha i in the base group as the public key, and the secret key is going to be the corresponding secret key alpha i, uh, corresponding exponent alpha i. Now, in order to generate a secret key for a attribute uh, bit wi, since it's a multi-authority attribute-based encryption scheme, we only generate the uh, secret keys for attribute bits. We don't have any key vectors associated. So recall, no key vectors, only attribute bits. And the secret key, this partial secret key is simply going to be the product of this um, exponent along with the bit wi. So if you satisfy the attribute, then you will learn alpha i, otherwise you will not learn alpha i. Now let us see how to perform an encryption in this simplified LW11 scheme. The idea is that the encryption algorithm takes this input, an access structure, a monotone access structure, which can be, which is represented as a linear uh, secret sharing scheme because this corresponds to monotone span programs. 
And I'm going to simply consider that uh, it's a very simple access structure, a read once uh, a monotone access structure. And the ciphertext is going to consist of three components, a chem key and two different ciphertext components. The first ciphertext component, which is CT2, that's going to simply contain an encryption of a large vector uh, of random, uh, of just random exponents, R1 up till Rn. And then we will also have the second component of uh, ciphertext components. And the second ciphertext components are going to be, you, first we sample a secret vector, a random secret vector S. And we use this uh, access uh, structure A to secret share, this, uh, uh, secret share this vector S. So this is our secret. And we try to secret share it using the access structure because the access structure can be imagined like a secret sharing scheme. And we basically, encrypt, we basically encrypt this as like an Elgamal encryption, where we use the ith user's public key as the uh, ith public key here, and the uh, the randomness exponent ri will be the randomness of the Elgamal encryption. So the ith user's public key and the ith uh, randomness coefficient is going to be used as a masking term for masking the secret share for the secret s corresponding to the ith row of the secret sharing matrix. Now, the, the chem value, the key encapsulation value of this encryption system is going to be simply the first element of the secret S that I sampled randomly. That's going to be the chem value in the target group. Okay. So now let me actually explain how to perform decryption. That's going to clarify all this magic of bilinear maps and all this magic of algebra. So during decryption, we have a ciphertext and we have a bunch of secret keys for these different input values. Now, suppose we have, so, uh, now since uh, we have like an accepting input, then there must be a vector, a reconstruction vector such that we can use this reconstruction vector, take linear combinations of the rows of the access structure A and come up with a uh, row vector such that the first com column, uh, the first vector, the first element of that row vector is going to be a one. This is the property of linear uh, secret sharing schemes that linearly we can combine these secret sharing schemes to come up with the, uh, the uh, to come up with the first basis vector in the canonical basis vector. Now, once we compute such a reconstruction vector, the idea is as follows. We first compute some term K1. This K1 term is basically, we take all these key terms these key terms for these different users, which are Elgamal encryptions basically for these different users. And we align them in a, in, a, in, a, in a row vector and take the inner product of this row vector with our secret sharing terms, with our, with our reconstruction terms. Now these are in the target group. So we basically raise it to the exponents and perform the multiplication in the target group. Next, we also have these reconstruction vectors. We multiply each reconstruction vector individually to the corresponding secret key. We raise it to that exponent. And then we basically uh, compute this. We basically take the inner product between this vector, the secret key vector, and this uh, and the ciphertext vector, which encodes these randomness coefficients for the corresponding l encryptions. And finally, my claim is that if I just uh, divide the K1 term by the K2 term, then that's going to give me the gain encapsulation uh, vector. Now, let me actually show it to you. So first, if we try to simplify the K1 term, then we are going to resolve in this following value because I'm multiplying this, I'm taking the inner product of the vector, reconstruction vector ZW with CTI, uh, 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 CT1 comma I for all I. And in that case, I'll multiply these ZWI coefficients with the corresponding CTI, uh, CT1 I terms. And that's going to give me this term. Similarly, I compute uh, this simplify this key to term and this key to term can also be satisfied. Uh, K2 term can also be satisfied, uh, can be simplified as follows. A linear combination of uh, these reconstruction vectors using these linear, uh, reconstruction vectors as coefficients of the terms, these alpha i r i, because r i is the, these randomness terms that are computed using this, that are present in the suffix and alpha i's are the secret terms that are given to me. Once I compute this, I can basically just yeah, divide them out. And that's going to give me the term ZWI in a product with uh, uh, just uh, uh, multiplied with uh, the 
uh, the inner product of the row vector, the ith row vector, and the uh, secret vector. And by the linear secret sharing properties, we get that this is going to give me the first element of the secret vector S, and which is exactly my chem value. So basically the idea is that you have to view the ciphertext as L gamal encryptions of the ith secret share. Ith row of this access structure is enables us the computing the ith secret share of the secret vector S. We perform the L gamal encryption and the chem value is simply the first element of the secret shared value. It's this first element just because we are computing a reconstruction vector in this following way, so that we can compute the first uh, the first basis vector in the canonical vector. And that's the high level idea behind uh, the uh, the loop over its construction. Now I'm actually really uh, throwing a lot of details under the rug, but I'm not talking about the global identifier model or a lot of other technical details. But this more or less captures the 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 core construction, the core ideas behind the loop over its construction. Now. Our idea trying to, so we want to take this multi-authority attribute-based encryption scheme and add IPFE framework to it, IPFE flavor to it. So how to upgrade it? That then, a natural first thought is to use ideas that have been developed in the literature already. Which show us that we can, we can lift any public encryption scheme, which has some nice homomorphic properties to any identity uh, to any inner product function encryption scheme. And the crux in those constructions to rely on the homomorphic structure of the PK public encryption schemes. And the point is that each vector bit will be encoded using independent public key. And now decryption for a vector is simply a linear combination of all these underlying PK keys. So we have these underlying PK secret keys, you linearly combine them and that's going to be a decryption key for that particular uh, secret vector that you have. And now during decryption, the user is going to homomorphically compute, just homomorphically compute these different individual PKE keys, PKE ciphertext into a single PKE ciphertext. And that single PKE ciphertext can be decrypted using its linearly combined uh, PKE key that it uh, received as part of the decryption key. And unfortunately, this idea does not work. It's a very clean and elegant idea, but it does not seem to work for current multi-authority attribute-based encryption schemes that we have. Or let me add a little bit of a, let me say with a bit of a caveat. We, we, we actually show in our paper that we can use this framework, this above framework, this Abdallah et al. framework to go from multi-authority AB to multi-authority attribute-based IPFE, but only for the classes of inner product predicates. But if you want to go to monotone span programs, then we have to rely on some other cool ideas. And very briefly, the problem here is that Typically in the above idea, in the above PK to IPFE lifting theorem idea, the chem key, the, the chem key is the underlying decryption key that is actually chosen during decryption encryption time. Thus it can be linearly combined when you have to give that particular linear combination to a particular user as its partial key. But the chem key in the loop over orders construction, if you look at the chem key in the loop over orders construction, that is chosen during encryption time, not at setup time. Thus, it is unclear how to actually give linear combinations of the chem key as part of the partial, as part of the key generation process, because that's chosen during the encryption time. Now, with that, let us just yeah, look at the simple trick that we came from this work. And the idea is very simple. The idea is that if we look very closely at the Lugo orders construction, then we will observe that the chem terms are actually masked with each authority's master secret key using the Elgamal encryption. And we simply have to give a projection of these unmasking terms instead of a projection of the chem terms. A linear combination can be regarded as a projection. And previously we were giving a projection of the PK keys. Now we only have to give out a projection of these unmasking terms, which the authority, each authority does know. And now the LSS reconstruction, these linear uh, secret sharing reconstruction, they only touch the rows of the matrix A. Now we can perform the projection on the columns so that there won't be any uh, mangling that's going to happen. The reconstruction happens on the row side, the projection happens on the column side. So that's why these, these, uh, these operations, these algebraic operations are totally independent and do not affect each other. And a very crucial important fact is that we have to rely on the fact that the randomness for the underlying encryption systems has to be reused across different masking terms. Otherwise, uh, 
the entire framework doesn't work. And you have to be very careful with this. I'll, I'll elaborate more on that in the coming few slides. But let me just give you a very high level overview of how to actually upgrade this loop of orders construction to an I, uh, to a multi-authority ABIPFE scheme. So this is the loop of orders construction. I just copied this from two slides ago. And let's just update it um, step by step, following the intuition that I said that we are going to sort of uh, give projections of the masking terms that each authority computes. And each authority's masking terms are these as these random exponents. So first, uh, we switch out the setup algorithm. Instead of sampling a single uh, exponent, we sample a, a sequence of exponents, a large vector of exponents, where the number of exponents is the same, is the length of the vectors that we want to actually give out an IPEFE, you want to design an IPEFE system for. So we'd have those many exponents, each authority samples those many exponents. And now the secret key is going to be, instead of, that particular secret key given out in public, if you satisfy the attribute, it's the inner product of your masking term with the key term, with the key vector W, inner product of your secret key and the inner product, and then multiply it by whether you are satisfied that particular attribute or not. Now, pretty natural so far. Now let's see how to actually perform encryption. During encryption, we now also have this message vector, this message vector U. And instead of now having a chem mechanism because it's no longer an uh, all or nothing encryption system, it's a functional encryption system, it's an IPF encryption system, we have to actually encrypt the message vector itself. So our idea is as follows. We will keep the second component of the ciphertext as before, the CT2 is going to stay the same. But now the first component of the ciphertext, the CT1 comma I components, previously you were sampling just a single secret vector and performing the secret sharing just once for each row. Now we're going to perform the secret sharing n times for each row n times. And basically we're going to sample a secret matrix X, multiply AI times with S, and just we are going to use all our uh, Elgamal secrets, Elgamal public keys for the ith row in order to mask this particular secret value. But the crucial part is that we have to rely on the same randomness for all these independent Elgamal values, Elgamal encryptions. Pretty cool. So far, it seems to fit like the Abdullah et al. translation. Great. And now, just to actually tie things up, we have to uh, do the following. Now, this third component of the ciphertext, that's going to be the one-time pad. Basically, we hide the message vector using a one-time pad, where the one-time pad key is the first row of the secret vector of the secret matrix. Previously, we were using the first element of the secret matrix of the secret vector. Now we're going to use the entire secret, the first row of the secret vector, the secret matrix in order to mask this term. And naturally, the idea is for decryption is also pretty similar. We basically update the K1 first step where previously we were just taking the inner product between the, the ciphertext vectors and the deconstruction vector. Now we are also going to take the, the, the right multiply with the reconstruction vectors, but we left multiply with the key vector that we have. So on the right side, on the basically the row side of the matrix, we're going to perform reconstruction and the, on the column side of the matrix, we're going to perform this projection. And in order to compute the output, we're basically going to first compute the inner product between the third component of the ciphertext with the key vector and just uh, come up with these masking terms appropriately multiply and divide them. And then that will give you the inner product of the message vector U with your uh, key vector W, uh, with your key vector V as soon, as long as you actually satisfy, um, as, as long as you sort of satisfy your attributes, satisfy the access structure. And mathematically, we can sort of just uh, check again, the same math works out, the algebra works out. And it's not a very interesting thing to look at. But what is more crucial is that the ciphertext here actually shares the randomness coefficients across all these different, uh, all these different uh, 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 Elgamal terms or these bilinear terms. And typically, this was not a problem in the, the PKE to IPFE lifting theorems. But uh, it turns out to be a little bit of a problem in the case of attribute-based encryption systems. And the ideology is follows. So the first try would be trying to just simply merge the loop orders constructions and the PK to IPFE lifting theorems, these transformations, and trying to combine these proofs in an almost uh, black box way. And just trying to combine these proofs and just being done with that. 
unfortunately, that does not work. The reason is that Luke Orders relies on these dual system techniques, these dual system paradigms. And this dual system paradigms relies on the notion of semi-functional ciphertext distributions, where the ciphertext no longer work for basically the challenge ciphertext. When you switch it to a semi-functional ciphertext, it is no longer a good ciphertext for all the secret keys that you have to give it out for. And uh, ideas from PKA to IPFE are no longer applicable because we cannot switch our challenge ciphertext to a completely semi-functional ciphertext because our ciphertext can potentially be decrypted on a large number of, uh, it is possible we allow uh, decrypting our challenge ciphertext on a large number of keys and learning some partial information about the message vector. But we're only trying to say that uh, if you don't have any distinguishing keys, then you should not be able to learn the underlying message, uh, the underlying, you should not be able to distinguish the underlying uh, message vector. But you do have accepting keys. In traditional multi-authority attribute-based encryption systems, you do not have any accepting keys. Here, we do have accepting keys because the accepting keys have the property that the evaluation of both the challenge messages is going to be the same. The challenge vectors, the two challenge vectors are going to give the same uh, inner product to the key vector if you have an accepting key. And that causes a problem. Now, I won't have enough time to actually tell you how to get around this problem, but the main idea in a nutshell is uh, simple again. So to that end, we actually introduce a new notion of semi-functional ciphertext that we call partial semi-functional ciphertext, which is very crucial to extend the notion of semi-functional ciphertext to this function encryption regime, where the idea is that these ciphertexts are going to be nominally semi-functional semi across all but one projected subspace. So there are so many different subspace in the underlying message, in the underlying ciphertext, right? And it's only one particular subspace where we have to perform the, 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 the magic of dual systems paradigm. But for all the other subspaces, we don't have to perform the magic of dual systems paradigm. But over there, we can't treat them as independent subspaces because all these are tied using the same random terms, same randomness coefficients. So we have to actually define something called nominal semi-functional semi-functionality for all these other and uh, input uh, all these other uh, projection spaces, but for the challenge projection space, we have to actually rely on this, make it completely semi-functional. And I refer you to look at the paper for interesting details. It's a pretty, uh, it's a pretty neat notion of uh, uh, partial semi-functional security. And I believe it's going to be very meaningful if we sort of try to push this uh, forward and try to come up with more interesting uh, notions in trying to combine multi-authority attribute for functional encryption systems with other type of functional encryption systems, because this is going to appear again and again. Now, just trying to summarize, in this work, we gave a lot of, uh, we proposed this incredible notion of multi-party functional encryption systems, and we gave these amazing new positive results. And I was able to only describe to you this multi-authority AD IPFA systems from blind bilinear groups. But we also have a bunch of other interesting function classes that we show that we can realize that we can actually instantiate very simply using multi-party function encryption systems, this framework of MPFE, and we can actually give new constructions for these things. Finally, trying to conclude this uh, uh, talk, I described the notion of multi-party function encryption system. And uh, the multi-party function encryption system is a universal, is an amazing framework, is a, uni is a unifier, which comes with this simple framework, trying to come up with a framework for all multi-user encryption systems in the function encryption regime. It enables abstraction of technical ideas across user models. So we developed some use, some in, nice ideas in the IPFE landscape. We developed some interesting ideas in the multi-authority landscape, as we saw. And we were able to sort of abstract these ideas in a more coherent way and use them in, 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 uh, to get something more out of it. And it also, this MPFE, it also makes it easier to interpolate the space of unexplored functionalities. Like we were able to say, okay, hey, we can combine multi-authority, attribute-based encryption, and IPFE to come up with a totally new uh, primitive. We can combine uh, decentralized predicate encryption or IPFE. We can combine policy hiding encryption, or we can combine distributed uh, uh, dynamic uh, decentralized function encryption systems and to get something more. So there are so many interesting unexplored functionalities that are out there. And uh, yeah, it would be wonderful if you can actually just come with a more systematic approach of trying to sort of come up with those functionalities. And there's so many fascinating open questions. And as I was alluding to earlier, we build some natural functionalities from standard assumptions. And with that, I would like to take a leave. Thank you for listening. And the paper is online. And the e-print number is 2020-1266. Thank you for listening. Have a great day.